It's our this week's parsha is parsha b'shalach. We have Yehumish. It's chapter thirteen in the Book of Exodus, chapter thirteen, and we'll start on verse Yudchat eighteen. Eight. There's the following. When God turned around the people that was directing uh, the, 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 uh, the departure from, from Egypt, and he turned the people towards the way of the wilderness of the Sea of Reeds. And a very important word here, and the children of Israel were armed when they came forth from the land of Egypt. Now the word Vachamushim, a lot, of, excuse me, a lot of interpretations on that. What what smaller words do you see in, in the word chamushim? What's chamesh? Chamesh. So someone has suggested instead of saying with instead of translating the word as being armed, but it was one fifth of the people <clears throat> departed from Egypt, meaning four fifths, um, according to many of our sages, perished during the plague of darkness. So we have only one fifth coming out. Uh, the simple translation is that uh, they were armed with weapons, but also you have chomish, um, which means five, misha. And let me just let me just get this Gemara. The Talmud tells us that from the word bachamushim is milami shemizuyim bachamisha minei zayin. According to our sages, when they departed from Egypt, not only were armed with weapons. But Chamesh is five. There were five basic um, weapons of that time that they had with them. And these are the five. More, it's a missionary in a, in Shabbat that says it's Besayif, a sword, a keshes, a bow, bow and arrow, I suppose, a low, but tris or bala. You need certain types of shields. It was a round shield, and this other shield had these long shields that shaped something like a triangle. And the fifth one was with a spear, Romach, a spear. So there are five basic uh, weapons that the Bnei Yisrael had when they departed from Egypt. So these are, these are some interpretations. Either it means one-fifth, or it means armed with five special weapons. Um, so these are the, the, the some of the, the uh, interpretations that our sages tell us. Okay. And verse 19, it says, Moshe, it's not saving all. Now, what was Moshe doing now? He remembered there was something that Yosef told the people. Done. Right? What did he say? Joseph. Jo Joseph, the bones of Joseph. Right. Remember, Yosef adjured the people before he passed away, make sure to remove my bones, my, my remains, from the land of Egypt. So, but who was taking care of it? Interestingly enough, it wasn't the children of, of Manasseh and Ephraim his descendants, it was Moshe Rabbeinu. What were the other, what were they doing? Why did Moshe take care of Moshe was a lady. So what was, what is he doing with Yosef's bones? You normally, it should be the children of Yosef, which would be Menashe and Ephraim. Why weren't they involved in that? Who was going to give it to him? Excuse me? I mean, maybe, maybe they gave it to Moshe, but who was going to no, give it to No, it doesn't say that. It says Moshe got it. Weren't they it seems like they were, they, were, they, were, they were more concerned about getting the uh, uh, jewelry or whatever it was uh, from Egypt before they departed. They were involved in that. And they were, they, even though they knew about it, but Moshe Rabbeinu took care of that part. It was Moshe, who, he was a lady. Moshe Rabbeinu had, was not a descendant of Yosef. He was, came from the tribe of, um, of, 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 of the Levites. And he was involved. Who told what? him that that promise was made? Of course he knew. I mean, come on, this must have been a, a well-known thing. Not only did Joseph do it, but it appears, according to our sages, every um, head of the tribe, you know, the, the children of Yaakov, had, had their children promise them that when they departed from Egypt, they would take their remains. So it was not just, although the Torah doesn't say it, the Torah explicitly states Joseph's remains, but it was all the remains of the, all the other uh, uh, heads of the tribes, Reuben, Shimon, uh, all the rest of them, their descendants took out their remains when they departed from Egypt. That's what it, uh, it mentions. Uh, but that's, uh, that's what they remembered and they forgot so much else. 
Yeah. That say in the day they 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 remembered this, but they forgot everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now the uh, the Gemara in in Soka says the says the following. And our our departure here in the Torah, it says that who was involved in in, in removing the remains of Yosef? Moshe Rabbeinu. But yet, if you look at the book of Joshua, in fact, we had this in the beginning of the year when we started when we studied Joshua. It says the following in verse in the chapter 24 in the book of Joshua. It says, Yes, Atmos Yosef, Ashehalubene Israel, me Mizraim, the the uh, the bones of Yosef that Bene Israel brought forth when they went out of Egypt, they buried Koru Shem, they buried them in Shem. So that doesn't make sense. The Torah, the Torah says, who took care of took care of the remains of Yosef? Moshe Rabbeinu. And in the book of Joshua, it says, who, who buried uh, uh, the um, Joseph remains? It says, the, the uh, tribe of Yosef, who took the bones out from his, from his right remains of his right. So make up your mind. Was it Moshe Rabbeinu? Here it says Moshe Rabbeinu did it. And the book of Joshua says the descendants of Yosef did it. So why does it say over there the descendants of Yosef did it? But really Moshe did it? So here is a uh, the answer that the Gemara gives. Omar Rabbi Chama Bar Chanina Rabbi Chana Bar Chanina says, Kol Ose Davar Velo Gemara. Let that person starts the mitzvah. But he didn't have a chance to complete the mitzvah. So who gets Uvo Acher Gomro? And another person came and completed that mitzvah. Malav Akosu Kil Gomro Kil Also. That the Torah considers, or the Book of Joshua considers, that the one who completed the mitzvah has to be did the whole mitzvah. It's concerned. It's it's it, the the, um, the one who completed the mitzvah. It's named after him. So no Moshe Rabbeinu started the mitzvah, but he didn't complete the mitzvah. He just removed the bones of Yosef, of Yosef from the land of Egypt, but he didn't bury it. It was the slow, it, was, it was traveling with Bnei Yisrael as they traversed through the desert. But since it was the, the children of Yosef buried him, the book in Joshua gives the, the children of Yosef credit and not Moshe Rabbeinu, because they completed the mitzvah. Okay, that seems to be a... Uh, Rabbi, why did they yeah. bury him in Shechem? That's where it all started, I suppose. Remember... Where was he sold? In the city of... Oh, because in the oh, area yeah, of in Shechem. Uh, uh. And remember, in last... Well, it wasn't last week's part, the part in Vayechi, it says that Yaakov gave Yosef... Shechem achar el One more thing, he gave Yosef more than the other brothers, specifically the city of Shechem. And that's where Yosef was buried, because that's where... Uh, well, because of it, although it was a bad thing, because he Yosef was sold by Shechem, and he became the uh, viceroy of Egypt, and and, be, and and through that he was able to sustain his own brothers during the hunger years. So Shechem, that city, was given to Yosef. Yeah. Okay. No, now it says if you look carefully in the wording of the verse nine, verse nineteen. It says Yat Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him. What it means? What does it mean with him? While Yosef's bone, well, the reins of Yosef was traveling through the desert, where was it housed? Where was it put? On a wagon. I don't know, but it says a wagon. A chariot. What does it mean with him? Look what it says. And Yosef, Moshe, took, Moshe took the remains of Yosef, Emo, with him. What does that mean with him? So, according to our sage, with him means in his, where, where the tribe of Levi was situated. So it seems like the remains of Yosef was placed in the in the area where the tribe of, of Levi was. Not not by Menashe Ephraim. It's with him, meaning with Moshe Rabbeinu. Oh. Okay. Um. okay. Now let's go further. Um, oh, remember I said not only were the, were the remains of Yosef removed from Egypt, but all the other brothers uh, told their children that their, that their descendants to take their remains with them. And, how do, and here, 
uh, here it is, real carefully in verse 19, it says, he hashbea, he shbea as Bnei Yisrael more, because he made Bnei Yisrael swear that when God remember them, they will take out the, the bones of, uh, of Yosef. But it, it uses a double verb, because it could have simply said, he shbea as Bnei Yisrael. He made Bnei Yisrael swear that they will take Yosef, made Yosef before he died, made Bnei Yisrael swear to take his remains. But it says, this is a double verb, hashbea hishbea. So translated precisely, it wouldn't make sense in English, but I believe like saying, he swore, he made them swear, he made them swear. Like he, it's a, he's repeating the word. So from here we see, since it's a double verb that's written in the Torah, I mean, it's not just the, Yosef had his, his, uh, his descendants swear to him, but every uh, head of the tribe, I mean, every Reuven, Shimon, and the other ones, made their children also swear, not only Yosef. They made every every founder of their tribe made their descendants, to, uh, made them swear that their descendants will remove their remains from, from Eretz Mitzrayim. So it's not just Yosef, as it appears in the Torah, but every single uh, descendant of the, of the heads of the tribe uh, took the remains of their uh, their ancestor and brought it out of Egypt and eventually buried them in Israel. Okay. Um, good. Now, go further. Okay, you brought the same chapter. Chapter four. Let's switch. Let's skip to verse seven. Um, Parah had a change of heart. Originally, Parah said, "Let them go." He was too glad to get rid of Bnei Israel of all the problems. But uh, he had a change of heart and said, "How can we do such a thing? All this, all this, all these people were letting them leave." Uh, so it says. Let me see. Then. Uh, it says like this. Verse 6. So what did he do? He went ahead and he, uh, he himself went ahead and uh, connected the horses uh, to his own chariot. Uh, which is usually not the usual, uh, the usual procedure. I mean, what the king, that would be neat to the dignity of a king to actually connect the horses to the chariot. He has servants to it, but not in this case. Look, this is by Esau He himself went ahead and and connected the horses to a chariot. Yes, and he took his people with him. It's most of them, why did he do that? Is because he wanted to show you. See, don't be afraid. Let's go get them. I myself will go ahead and, and connect my horses to my own chariot. Uh, normally, my servants would do it. I'm not going to do that. It's very important. And I'll eventually tell them that when if we get any booty or any anything like that, I will not take anything. We will share it because usually the king would take whatever he wants, and then the remainder the people will take or the other uh, people. I went with him on uh, uh, when the, they were pursuing the Jews. But he said, no, I'm doing everything myself. And and when they, when they saw that, Paro did everything like Adam. So then they joined him. Okay. Okay. And... okay let's go. Now if we go to Oh, yeah. If you, go, if you go to chapter 14 and go down to verse 13, okay, chapter 14, verse 13. So Paro was uh, uh, was pursuing them, and Bnei looked back, Bnei Israel looked back, and they see the Egyptians coming, and they were stretching, you know, they're complaining. Well, Moshe, what did you do with us? Maybe we should stay in Egypt. Look, the Egyptians are coming. We were doomed. Okay. And, and 
But what does what does Moshe say? Vayomar Moshe on Altira Moshe to the people. And Moshe said to the people, Altira, don't be afraid. It's Yatsvuru Sishas Hashem. You're going to now see the salvation of God. Ashi Asel Lachem Hayom that's going to do for you today. Ki Asheri Yisemes Mitzrayim Hayom Lo Sul Sifal or Osom Ot Ad Olam. And what you just like you're seeing them now, will not see them anymore. Okay. Hmm. Okay. According to the Gemara in, in the Jerusalem Talmud, you know there was like anything else, you know. It, it, Issues are coming. Uh, it wasn't just one opinion. There were many opinions. Everybody had a different opinion. And this is what the Gemara says. And it elaborates on what the Torah said. <clears throat> this time you will learn a price. Arba Kitos Nasu Lav There are four opinions that the people had who went out of Egypt. Achas Omeris once said, Napoleon, let's go to the sea. It's okay. We have faith. The other says, hey, wait a second. We better return back to Egypt. We don't want to die. That was another group. Oh, no. Let's, let's have a war with them. Let's take our weapons. We'll fight them. And the other one said, let us cry out to God in prayer. So he had four different opinions. What do you do in a case like this? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, you don't go back. You don't go well. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu like made statements to each of these uh, opinions. Okay, Zusha Amra Nafoliam, the one who said, "Let's go into the sea." Amal Hashem Moshe Yisgat Zusha Tuas and Shem. He said to him, "You're right. You go stand back and you'll see the salvation of God." Because it meant eventually the sea will split. Zusha Amra Nachzolam Israim. The other one said, "Let's go back to Egypt." Moshe Rabbeinu said to them in the verse, in verses coming up, Just like you see them now, I promise you have to see them again. So don't go back. Back in the, they don't have to. One that says, And the other group said, well, let's fight them. Have a war with them. So he said to them, no. Hashem will fight for you. Don't, you don't have to pick up your arms and fight them. The Abzusha Amaras, it's a Bayak Negdam, let's cry out against them, cry out to God. He said, No, Amalam Atak, let's be quiet, we'll see the salvation of God. In fact, although prayer is important at this particular time, it's not the time for prayer, it's the time for action. And I like, uh, as uh, as the Torah will proceed uh, to tell us that uh, don't that, that then God tells Moshe. Uh, don't cry out. Don't, uh, you'll see a, a great salvation. Okay. Uh, okay. So I said, just continue on. And okay, as you know, uh, what happens? You have the Kriyat Yamsu, the splitting of the Sea of Reeds. So it says okay. here in verse um, in verse 15, Vayom Hashem uh, Moshe. So it says, don't cry out to me. So he's talking to Moshe, not to the people. Yeah. Well, to Moshe, see, even to Moshe, Moshe, Moshe thought maybe he kept, it was, Moshe was starting, according to the Gemara Sofa, Moshe was starting to pray. Pray that everything should happen. And Hashem said to him, this is not the time for prayer. Time for action. Speak to the people like you'll see in, right after that, in the next verse. Uh, where is it? Tabera B'nai so yeah, you look at the so end of that. So is this moment uh, when Moshe is not so sure either? No, no. He knew that something will happen because even at the, he tells them, even he wanted to pray, even, even Hashem told Moshe, it's not, it's not even time for you to pray. Just don't cry out to me. If you look at verse 15, look at that. It says, it's just saying, yeah. by Yom Hashem Moshe, I'm out to son. What are you crying out to me? This is not yeah. the time for prayer. This is time for action. Tell B'nai so just continue on. Tell B'nai so you so let them go. So sometimes prayer is important, but in certain times, God feels this is not the time for prayer. We got to do things. We got to take care of this. Time for action. So this wasn't a moment of doubt for Moshe. Uh, I don't think so. He knew that something was going to happen. You know, uh, I don't think anybody realized what's going to take place. I mean, to, but uh, 
Uh, and it says, verse, verse 16 tells, uh, God tells Moshe, raise your staff and uh, over the river, over the, uh, the Sea of Reeds, and it will split. And Menei Israel eventually will be able to cross the uh, Yam Suf, the, the Sea of Reeds, on dry land. Even that was a great miracle. Because normally, even if it's, the river was split, the, the ground must have been muddy. But that was another part of the miracle. The ground was not muddy. It became uh, dry and be able to cross over. The only thing I don't know, somebody asked me this, and I, I haven't found an answer. Maybe you know, maybe somebody mentioned it. How long did it take for the stroll to cross the, the um, Sea of Reeds? Anybody, anybody mention any commentary on that? I don't know. Anybody hear a commentary? Nobody? Okay. I'm trying to find out. Somebody asked me that. How long did it take? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So, well, I have another question since you brought yeah. that up. So when they, when they crossed, they did. They all they all went in twelve lanes in twelve tribes. Yeah, you're right. According to our sages, it wasn't just one lane. It was twelve lanes. Each tribe took one lane. You're right. Well, how, how do we know that from this? Uh, I don't have my scissor here. Wait, wait. You have a scissor? If you remember us in the Saturday morning prayer, I'll show it to you. That I'm getting a scissor. There is, uh, I forgot the chapter, but it, it, it tells us many different things that God did. And it says, the Gozer Yam Subit Zorim. God split the, the Sea of Reeds into many parts. I'm, let me, I'm just going to get a Siddur, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly where it is. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, and it, it split into 12 parts according to our sages. So each, tri each tribe took one path. Oh, yeah, okay. If you have your heaven, right? If you have your um, art scroll sitter, uh, you can say it every Saturday morning. Let me get that chapter. And if you don't have a city, you can look it up in, in the book of Psalms. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. In the Psalms is chapter 136. And it has, in fact, there's 26 sentences. And every sentence ends uh, ends with the word "Kili Olam Kasto." God's mercy endures forever. And let me get the oh here it is. And this David Melech wrote this. Le Gozer Yam Zvik Zorim, and the and uh, the art scroll translates it. We praise God who divided the Sea of Reeds into parts, the many parts. Zvik Zorim. So. Uh, based on that particular statement, our sages said that each tribe had a special path. Okay? So, yeah, it's going to be looking at Psalm 136, you will find it. Okay. Let's go further. Mm -hmm. How do you say C? In Hebrew? What? How do you say the, the uh, C of Yam, reeds? Soup. Yam, Yam, right? Yam is a C. Soup right. is the reeds. Okay. Paro, I think in Pasha's Shemot, when Moshe came before him and said, uh, God said, let my people go. So what did Paro say originally? Me, Lashem. Who is God that I have to listen to him? Me. Me is spelled Mem Yud, me. So there's a midget that says, you know, you want to know who me, who God is? Just transpose the letters. Yeah. Mem Yud, transpose it. Yud Mem is Yam. You know when you know who I am? I am. Me will become Yam. <laughs> that's very interesting. So Yam, that's how uh, uh, one of the commentators understood it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, let me see. Now it's, it, although God meets out justice, strict justice, he, oh, I mentioned it many times, he mingles it with some sort of mercy. Like Hashem Elokim. We even say in the Brachat, the Brachat to Hashem Elokim. Hashem is, is the God with the element of mercy. Elokim, Elokim. That's with, with strict justice. 
We say it together, Shem Elohim. He mixes strict justice with, with compassion. And it's very interesting. Here he's he's go, he's going ahead and he's destroying the the, the, um, the Egyptians who really were very cruel to us. If you look at verse 27, look what it says. He ate Moshe and Moshe went ahead and stretched his hand over the um, sea of reeds. By Yoshua Yom the Pros Bokel is to know. And and eventually the, the uh, water went ahead and turned back again uh, towards the morning. But uh, uh, it's it, it, it sort of saying what's going to happen really didn't happen yet. Because and the Egyptians were pursuing the Jews going into the water. Look what it says. And Hashem went ahead and uh, made the Egyptians uh, drown into the into the Yam soup, into the Sea of Reeds. It's interesting. Say that Elohim is the is the uh, refers to God with the element of of, um, of, of, uh, of justice, strict justice. But yet when he goes ahead and he's drowning the Egyptians, look at the word, it doesn't say by Yanir Elohim, it's by Yanir Hashem. So even when he goes ahead, saying this week's Parsha, when he goes ahead, he's having the Egyptians drown in the Sea of Reeds, it doesn't say by Yanir Elohim, it's by Yanir Hashem. Even somehow, even though he's, he's drowning, causing the Egyptians to be drowned, but nevertheless, somehow there was an element of, of mercy. How was that possible? Where did, how did God show an element of mercy to the Egyptians who were drowning? They're still his creation. No, no, no but how did he show it? How, he's, he, he's drowning his creations. You're, you're right, he created them. But how is he showing an element of mercy? As the Torah says, by Hashem. That Hashem no, it, causes them. It's more gentle to spill water over you than to drown. I don't know. It, it seems like not every Egyptian drowned the same way. If a person may be somehow good to some degree, he maybe he died immediately. But the uh, other Egyptians who might have been very wicked and evil to the to their to Jews when they were slavery, so maybe they were hitting against the the bottom part of the river against rocks, who knows what, and kept alive and being punished as they're being drowned. The ones who are more righteous and were not so cruel to the Jews, well, maybe they died right away. So they didn't feel the pain. Those who are cruel and to, to the Bnei Israel, they their, their drowning was more uh, uh, was more strict and more and more serious and dangerous. It could be. That's what it is. But interesting it said, yes. What about the possibility the Egyptians wanted genocide? They wanted to kill the entire nation, all the Jews. Hashem only killed the soldiers. He let the rest of the children and the rest of the Egyptians live in Egypt. Yeah, but also in Egypt. Remember when the last plague was only the firstborn? Right. And the other Egyptians were left uh, or being alive. A lot of the Egyptians at the end were good to the Jews. Uh, yeah, that's true. They gave them. And also, um, uh, who didn't drown? Everybody of those, of, of the army that pursued Israel. Pharaoh didn't drown. Who was not? Who didn't drown? Pharaoh didn't drown. Pharaoh, yeah. It says that Pharaoh did not drown. Why was he left alive? So he could suffer. He could see everything yeah. he did. Yeah, that's true, but God wanted him to see what was going on, that be able to go back to the people in Egypt and tell them oh, all wrong. what happened. Because right. all of a sudden, nobody, he's comes back alive. The only one had to tell them something. So uh, he was kept alive. He could go back and say, I saw this in my own eyes, the splitting of a sea, the Egyptian, oh my army has been drowned in the sea. I'm the only survivor that told the story. You know, so it was a, a lesson. That was the whole thing also with the with the makos, with the plagues. It wasn't just a punishment for the Egyptians. It was to show the Egyptians the power of God, that God is in control of the world. And their pagan gods were helpless. That's why at the end of the first, by the, the uh, what did say, by the, by the firstborn, the, the plague of the firstborn, mm -hmm. not only um, the, the firstborn of Egyptians were uh, died, but also it says that the 
uh, the, uh, their, their temples yeah, also were destroyed during that particular time. So let me yeah. ask, so the question is, so if he wanted Pharaoh to go back and tell the whole world what happened, how come you correct. don't find that in any Egyptian hieroglyphics? Because the hier in hieroglyphs, they only told the good. They will never have fought the bad. At one time I, I had a, I once I took a, a ancient, ancient history course, and one of the professors said that in ancient civilizations, they would not go ahead and write the bad about their kings, only the good things. That's what he told us. So he must have known history better than I know it. But that's what he said one time. And that's why, yeah, he was a non Jew. He says, That's why I believe the Torah. You see, he, he says, I'm not a Jewish person, but I know what the Bible says. And he said, I, I accept that account because the Torah tells the good and the bad. And the ancient civilizations, they would never report the bad. They wouldn't put that in hieroglyphics, only the good things. That's what he said. I, I, and I'm not a historian to know if he was right enough, but I assume he knew what he was talking about. That's what he had actually said that. And he wasn't a Jew, he was a non Jewish professor. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, that's really good. Further? This week you be able to discuss the Torah portion. Enjoy your time. Ah. Uh, here we go. Soup. Oh, yeah. This is the Gemara And even Jews here. It just shows you that even the, the, our own people, even when they were eyewitnesses to this miraculous thing, there is a Gemara, I'm quoting it, Gemara Pesachim, it says the following. It's about first let's at the verse. It says, uh, in verse 30, by Yahusha Hashem is beyond was Yisrael Miyam Yisraelim. Hashem saved on that day all the Israel, the, the Jews, from the hand of the Egyptians. By Yahusha Hashem is beyond was Yisraelim. And Yisrael saw the Egyptians dead. Some of the bodies were, were cast out of the river and they saw the Egyptians were dead. What did happen? They have to see it? The Gemara said, <clears throat> excuse me, the Gemara brings down a verse like this. It's a book in, in the book of Tehillim and Psalms in chapter 106. It says, you know, in that, in that chapter, and David Amelech was the author of the, of the book of Psalms, it says, Yamru al -yam, al -yam -yam it, there was an element of our own people who rebelled while they were crossing or after they crossed the, uh, the Sea of Reeds. Which means, by there were some children of Israel, some of our Jews, saying at that time when all this was happening, splitting of the sea, and they saw the drowning of the Egyptians. And look what they, some would say the following, all of sides. They're just like we came out of the, 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 uh, the Sea of Reeds on this side of the river. Oh, so the Egyptians must have been saved also. They were not all drowned in the sea, they must have gone. Uh, on, on the other side, they were able to, to go to, to leave the uh, Sea of Reeds that way, just like we came out of this side. That's what they said. Okay, so that's why it says over here in the verses that Yisrael saw the Egyptians dead on the on the edge of the water, on the banks of the water, to tell us, uh, he said, so to speak, God commanded the sea. Throw out, throw out all the dead bodies onto the dry land. And, and Pulton, the Abosha, the, 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 uh, so to speak, the river obeyed, and they threw out the, the uh, dead bodies. That those people who said, well, maybe the Egyptians were saved on the other side, they saw all the dead bodies that the Egyptians, when the, when the, that, the, the, uh, that the river cast out. That's what it means always about Yari Yisrael as Mr. Mesas Fasyom at the edge of the sea. Uh, the the Bnei Yisrael saw the actual Egyptians dead. But they, so even when it was such a great miracle, and, and we had our own people saying, well, maybe they're safe on the other side of the river. Okay. So that's why the Torah says they, they were like eyewitnesses to see the actual Egyptians dead. Because the sea, so to speak, cast out all the dead bodies onto the, onto the land. First state, that's what it says in the Gemara. So from the, t from the time yeah. they left uh, Egypt to get to the Red Sea was a week? I don't know. Oh, so they got to the Red Sea about a week, yeah. But I don't know, again, I can, I, never, I have never seen it. 
I don't know how long did it take for Israel to cross the Red Sea. I don't know. Oh, okay, but then my, then my question is, so yeah. we don't know how, you know, during that week, why they weren't hungry or thirsty or anything, right? We don't hear anything. Oh, you know, they had a lot of matzah. It seems like from right, the but time wasn't they it, went wasn't out of it, Egypt. What was it? it? After they crossed the Red Sea, after two days or three days, they complained, they wanted to stop and cook. The, that was afterwards, right? Yeah, it, it seems like they, were the, they didn't have water, enough water, but they had enough food But what was the time they, they carried the matzah on the back and then they stopped right. and they cooked it? Well, that was after they crossed the Red Sea? They had some food with them. They did have some food with them. They came out with some provisions. And it, was, it lasted for a whole month because we find in the end of the Pasha, the 15th day of Iyar, of the second month, they started to complain and say, we have no food. And then the month, the manna, the month came down. But at, at this point, they did have, have uh, provisions. So when was it that they stopped walking, um, they had stopped walking and rested and cooked the, cooked the, the bread that they took with them? What, they, it seems like they had with them because if you look further in the Torah, this week's parsha. When you get it, uh, where is it? Um, was that after this? Well, the first they complained about water. That's true. If the um, about three days later, they didn't have water, but they had food. Uh -huh. And then uh, let me just see. Then a miracle happened that they were able to get the, the bit of water sweet. But after, but it wasn't until I think a month later. Uh, yeah, and when you saw, if you look at chapter 16, it, it says that there was the 15th day of the second month that then when they, they started to explain the motion our own, we should have eventually let us stay in Egypt. We had some food at least, we have no food now. And then again, they were given this miraculous food known as manna, man. But that didn't happen. So in other words, they didn't have enough provisions to last them about a month. Because it was the 15th day of the second month, being this what we would call ER, that they started to complain and murmur to Moshe, oh, no, we have no food. And then the man came, the man came, this heavenly food. Which was to sustain them throughout their trek through the desert. Okay, that was manna. Okay, now, what how? What custom do we have if we come down to the man, right? That's how, that's how they were sustained through the, throughout the desert. Now, how does this manner, what, what, uh, how does that relate to any, many, any law or any custom that we have? Do we do any custom that reminds us of the manner? To, to, to hala on Shabbat. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, we always have we call Mechem Mishnah, two chalot, or um, uh, on Shabbat or Yom Tov, because the manna never fell on, on, on Shabbat or for that matter Yom Tov, when they had the holidays. So, so the day before, whether it was Erev Shabbat on Friday or Erev Yom Tov, they would get a double portion. And that's why on Shabbat or on holidays, we always have what we call Mechem Mishnah, two whole chalot. It doesn't have to be hollow. It could be two whole matzahs. It could be, uh, oh, my, my Swati oh, friends always tell me that they have two pita breads, whole pita bread. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whatever it is, whatever your custom is, that's fine. Okay. So that's the reason uh, for that. Okay. And, and Rabbi uh, said last yesterday that they should have two for each meal two for <laughs> Friday night, two for Shabbos lunch, and two for um, Shalashudas, because that makes six for the whole week. If you have two, two, and two. Oh, that I never heard that's very nice. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh okay, so that's what we have. Uh we have two hollows. Oh, and also this from there we learn also preparation for Shabbat. Just like we see God gave us on Friday, Arab Shabbat, this double portion uh, uh to be that we have more. More food, but by the way, it's not just challah. Not that just they didn't just make challah out of it. They were able to make a meal out of that. Because that manna tasted like anything, you know. They, uh, they were able to cook it, and they, whatever it was, and made it taste like uh, chicken or whatever they wanted to taste like. <laughs> <laughs> really, that's what it says. Manna, uh, 
tasted like any food they so desired. Mm. Oh, my favorite question. What bracha did they recite before the eight mana? Because they say hamotzi lechem min haaretz. What does hamotzi lechem min haaretz mean? Came from the ground. Did this manna come from the ground? No. So a, a, but it a used to come from. Didn't you say it came from the trees? No, it didn't come from the trees. No, but you said once it came, it didn't come from the ground. It came from the tree, right from the sky. No, the manna came from heaven. Right. It didn't come from the trees. What they said was, this, this is this is your Shalom, the Jerusalem Talmud says, they couldn't, obviously they couldn't say, Amotzi Lechem in the he brings forth food from the ground, because it didn't come from the ground. They said, Amotzi Lechem in HaShomayim. That was a bracha. He brought forth food or bread from heaven. That was the bracha, according to our sages, that they recited before the eighth of mine. That's what he said. And what about Bir At that time, at that point, did they have any concept of saying grace after meals? When was that instituted? Moshe instituted the first ah, one. Ah, but when? That's right. Mm -hmm. he, when did he institute it? At that time, when the man of fell, Moshe Rabbeinu introduced a, the first paragraph of, uh, of benching, of the grace after meals. It doesn't mean the words we say he said, but it must be something like that relating to God, God sustaining other people with food. I said, Brother Hashanah, that's not called God sustains everybody with food. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, the concept of saying Berkat um, uh, uh, was introduced by Moshe Rabbeinu. Later on, the Torah specifies it, that when you eat and be satisfied, you bless God. But it was, but Moshe Rabbeinu knew about it, or maybe he, he told the people, and it was just written later. A lot of things the people knew right after they came out of Egypt, but it's not reported in the Torah to, to the, the book of Deuteronomy. Like Shema Yisrael, the hero of Israel prayer. Did, they, did, did the people recite Shema Yisrael as they trekked through the desert? Or I, I, I thought um, they said that when um, Yaakov was dying. Yes, yeah, so you see, they did know it. <clears throat> Many, a lot of things they did know, but the Torah does not record it till later on. Shema Yisrael, they did know. Like you said, there's a famous midrash that the, when Yaakov wasn't sure of all of his sons uh, abided by the mitzvahs, and they said, Shema Yisrael, meaning Yaakov. Here, Yaakov, our father Yaakov, we, we believe just like you believe. So the words they knew were just not recorded later until the, in the Torah. In this case, the Shema Yisrael was not written until the book of Deuteronomy in Pashat Ve'etz Hanan. But they knew Shema. Okay, so, that is, so that's how we uh, have double uh, portion of, of Shabbat, um, and in fact, I think I mentioned that uh, if for some reason, it could happen, you don't have bread, you don't have any color, whatever, something happened, the, the mere fact that you say tefillah, you mentioned in the, in the Shimon Esrei about Shabbat, and you even said, Shabbat, blessed is God who sanctified the Sabbath, that would be good enough. If for some reason you didn't have a double portion of bread at the Shimon And when was the first time they made Kiddush? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I, think, I, I think the only thing they had if a verbal kiddush would be sufficient. Because we don't find in the Torah that they make kiddush over wine. You don't find that. There's no place that says you have to make kiddush Friday night. It doesn't say that. The most it does say is to have lechem mishnah, two portions of bread. But what about kiddush? It doesn't say it. So it seems uh, uh, originally, even if you just said the fila, you said a prayer, and you said the broth of God sanctified the Shabbat, that would, be, that would suffice. You wouldn't have to make kiddush, but later on, an actual kiddush of a wine was ordained by our rabbis. Okay, uh, all right. So have a oh, it's already oh, have a wonderful Shabbat. Shabbat we shalom, say, Rabbi. Hope, Thank you. I hope we will be able to return to the shul quickly, and I'm like a you know like we're supposed to, but in the meantime, <laughs> uh, Shabbat shalom. And again, I'll be meeting you, God willing, on. What do I do it? Tuesday at 12.30, right? Mm -hmm. Continue our talk on the Book of Judges. Okay.
the bachelor one you have any other comments right yeah right thank yes, you bye bye to bachelor okay doctor what do you want to say hello nelly hello nelly question question when you mentioned pharaoh uh, yeah. uh taking his the, the horse with the chariots right well, this made me think of Avraham. Does anybody ever make the analogy with Avraham with doing the mitzvah? Of well, you think of his fellows and chasing after kings who um, who uh, captured Lot? Um, I know no, I no, didn't no. see it. Of saddling no. the donkey when with Yishmael oh. and, with, and with Yitzchak yeah. with the uh, Akira. Um, he let me the see. Himself, oh, I see what you mean. So, to do a mitzvah. Uh, the first thing to do a mitzvah. Baboka. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there any associate? I don't recall, but I'll let you know if I find it. All right. Good question. Anyone ever commented good, good, good question. Yeah. And the other thing, you mentioned Moshe with taking Joseph out of Egypt. Um, he couldn't fulfill the mitzvah of burying him. Of course. Because he never, went, he never entered Israel. You're right, but when, when it talks about the descendants of Yosef burying, burying the, the bones of Joseph, it says they brought him out of Egypt. But you had Lubnes in Israel that they brought him out. It wasn't, they didn't take him. They didn't yes. start the Israel. Moshe did that. So that's what it means. Uh, when the Gemara says over there that when one starts a mitzvah, the one who gets the credit is the one who finishes the mitzvah. Finishes the mitzvah. Yeah, one, that's what one, we learned. One last question. Who specifically was carrying the bones through the desert? Were they the Levites? It was in the Levite. It must probably the Levium. Interesting. Because it was they, they brought it into the place where the Levium were residing. Right. So the center zone was the Mishkan, the tabernacle, surrounding the Mishkan with the Kohanim and the Levium. In that camp, that part of the camp, that is where the remains of Yosef were, not by his tribe. Okay. And behind, and on all the four sides were the other tribes. But first was the Mishkan, the tabernacle, surrounded by the Kohanim and the Levium, and, then, and, and they were surrounded by all the other tribes of Israel on the four sides. <clears throat> yeah. So how could the Kohanim be near the, the uh, bones of Yitzchak? They didn't touch it. But they, also, they, didn't, they didn't actually touch it. They didn't become uh, ritually impure. And Moshe was a lady, it didn't really matter. Last, last question. And so the Levites that were carrying Joseph through the desert, were they the ones with, with Pesach Sheni? Uh, not necessarily. Maybe some of them. Some of them, okay. Because it doesn't say it was only Levine. It was, it was uh, anyone who came in contact with something okay. with the dead okay. body, they became defiled. They couldn't have Pesach, had, they had to eat Pesach Shani. Okay. I don't think it was just a Levine. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good Shabbat good shalom, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody. Good Shabbat.